Good evening. Welcome to tonight's reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars, the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm Finn J.D. John, and I will be your reader tonight under the auspices of my institution, the Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds. Chapter 27 From Joy to Death for ten days the hordes of Thark and their wild allies were feasted and entertained, and then, loaded with costly presents and escorted by ten thousand soldiers of Helium commanded by Mors Kojak, they started on the return journey to their own lands. The jet of lesser Helium, with a small party of nobles, accompanied them all the way to Thark to cement more closely the new bonds of peace and friendship. Sola also accompanied Tars Tarkas, her father, who before all his chieftains had acknowledged her as his daughter. Three weeks later, Mors Kojak and his officers, accompanied by Tars Tarkas and Sola, returned upon a battleship that had been dispatched to Thark to fetch them in time for the ceremony which made Dejah Thoris and John Carter one. For nine years I served in the council and fought in the armies of Helium as a prince of the house of Tardus Mors. The people never seemed to tire of heaping honors upon me, and no day passed that did not bring some new proof of their love for my princess, the incomparable Dejah Thoris. In a golden incubator upon the roof of our palace lay a snow-white egg. For nearly five years ten soldiers of the Jeddak's guard had constantly stood over it, and not a day passed when I was in the city that Dejah Thoris and I did not stand hand in hand before our little shrine, planning for the future when the delicate shell should break. Vivid in my memory is the picture of the last night as we sat there talking in low tones of the strange romance which had woven our lives together, and of this wonder which was coming to augment our happiness and fulfill our hopes. In the distance we saw the bright white light of an approaching airship, but we attached no special significance to so common a sight. Like a bolt of lightning it raced toward helium until its very speed bespoke the unusual. Flashing the signals which proclaimed it a dispatch bearer for the Jeddak, it circled impatiently while awaiting the tardy patrol boat which must accompany it to the palace docks. Ten minutes after it touched at the palace, a messenger called me to the council chamber, which I found filling with other members of that body. On the raised platform of the throne was Tardis Moors, pacing back and forth with tense, drawn face. When all were in their seats, he turned toward us. This morning, he said, word reached the several governments of Barsoom that the keeper of the atmosphere plant had made no wireless report for two days nor had almost ceaseless calls upon him from a score of capitals elicited a sign of response. The ambassadors of the other nations asked us to take the matter in hand and hasten the assistant keeper to the plant. All day a thousand cruisers have been searching for him until just now one of them returns bearing his dead body, which was found in the pits beneath his house, horribly mutilated by some assassin. I do not need to tell you what this means to Barsoom. It would take months to penetrate those mighty walls. In fact, the work has already commenced, and there would be little to fear were the engine of the pumping plant to run as it should and as they have for hundreds of years. But the worst we fear has happened. The instruments show a rapidly decreasing air pressure on all parts of Barsoom. The engine has stopped. My gentlemen, he concluded, we have at best three days to live. There was absolute silence for several minutes, and then a young noble rose, and with his sword drawn and held high above his head, he addressed Tardis Mors. The men of Helium have prided themselves that they have ever shown Barsoom how a nation of red men should live. Now is our opportunity to show them how they should die. Let us go about our duties as though a thousand useful years still lay before us. The chamber rang with applause, and as there was nothing better to do than to allay the fears of the people by our example, we went about our ways with smiles on our faces and sorrow gnawing at our hearts. When I returned to my palace, I found that the rumor already had reached Asia Thoris, so I told her all that I had heard. We have been very happy, John Carter, she said, and I thank whatever fate overtakes us that permits us to die together. The next two days brought no noticeable change in the supply of air but on the morning of the third day breathing became difficult at the higher altitudes of the rooftops. The avenues and plazas of Helium were filled with people. All business had ceased. For the most part, the people looked bravely into the face of their unalterable doom. 
Here and there, however, men and women gave way to quiet grief. Toward the middle of the day, many of the weaker commenced to succumb, and within an hour the people of Barsoom were sinking by thousands into the unconsciousness which precedes death by asphyxiation. Deja Thoris and I, with the other members of the royal family, had gathered in a sunken garden within an inner courtyard of the palace. We all conversed in low tones, when we conversed at all, as the awe of the grim shadow of death crept over us. Even Woola seemed to feel the weight of this impending calamity, for he pressed close to Deja Thoris and me, whining pitifully. The little incubator had been brought from the roof of our palace at the request of Deja Thoris, and she sat gazing longingly upon the unknown little life that now she would never know. As it was becoming perceptibly difficult to breathe, Tardus Morse arose, saying, Let us bid each other farewell. The days of the greatness of Barsoom are over. Tomorrow's sun will look upon a dead world, which through all eternity must go swinging through the heavens peopled not even by memories. It is the end. He stooped and kissed the women of his family and laid his strong hands upon the shoulders of the men. As I turned sadly from him, my eye fell upon Deja Thoris. Her head was drooping upon her breast. To all appearances, she was lifeless. With a cry, I sprang to her and raised her in my arms. Her eyes opened and looked into mine. Kiss me, John Carter, she murmured. I love you. I love you. It is cruel that we must be torn apart who were just starting upon a life of love and happiness. As I pressed her dear lips to mine, the old feeling of unconquerable power and authority rose in me. The fighting blood of Virginia sprang to life in my veins. It shall not be, my princess, I cried. There is, there must be some way, and John Carter, who has fought his way through a strange world for the love of you, will find it. And with my words there crept above the threshold of my conscious mind a series of nine long-forgotten sounds. Like a flash of lightning in the darkness, their full purport dawned upon me, the key to the three great doors of the atmosphere plant. Turning suddenly toward Tardos Morse as I still clasped my dying love to my breast, I cried, A flyer, Jeddah, quick! Order your swiftest flyer to the palace top! I can save Barsoom yet! He did not wait to question, but in an instant a guard was racing to the nearest dock, and though the air was thin and almost gone at the rooftop, they managed to launch the fastest one-man air scout machine that the skill of Barsoom had ever produced. Kissing Deja Thoris a dozen times, and commanding Woola, who would have followed us, to remain and guard her, I bounded with my old agility and strength to the high ramparts of the palace, and in another moment I was headed toward the goal of the hopes of all Barsoom. I had to fly low to get sufficient air to breathe, but I took a straight course across an old sea bottom, and so had to rise only a few feet above the ground. I traveled with awful velocity, for my errand was a race against time and death, the face of Deja Thoris hung always before me. As I turned for a last look as I left the palace garden, I had seen her stagger and sink upon the ground beside the little incubator, that she had dropped into the last coma which would end in death if the air supply remained unreplenished, I well knew. And so, throwing caution to the winds, I flung overboard everything but the engine and compass, even my ornaments, and lying on my belly along the deck with one hand on the steering wheel and the other pushing the speed lever to its last notch, I split the thin air of dying Mars with the speed of a meteor. An hour before dark, the great walls of the atmosphere plant loomed suddenly before me, and with a sickening thud I plunged to the ground before the small door which was withholding the spark of life from the inhabitants of an entire planet. Beside the door, a great crew of men had been laboring to pierce the wall, but they had barely scratched the flint-like surface, and now most of them lay in the last sleep, from which not even air would waken them. Conditions seemed much worse here than at Helium, and it was with difficulty that I breathed at all. There were a few men still conscious, and to one of these I spoke. If I can open these doors, is there a man who can start the engines? I asked. I can, he replied. If you open quickly, I can last but a few moments more. But it is useless. They are both dead, and no one upon Barsoom knows the secret of these awful locks. For three days men crazed with fear have surged about this portal in vain attempts to solve its mystery. I had no time to talk. I was becoming very weak, and it was with difficulty that I controlled my mind at all. But with a final effort, as I sank weakly to my knees, I hurled the nine thought waves at that awful thing before me. The Martian had crawled to my side, and with staring eyes fixed on the single panel before us, we waited in the silence of death. Slowly, 
the mighty door receded before us. I attempted to rise and follow it, but I was too weak. After it, I cried to my companions, and if you reach the pump room, turn loose all the pumps. It is the only chance Barsoom has to exist tomorrow. From where I lay, I opened the second door, and then the third, and as I saw the hope of Barsoom crawling weakly on hands and knees through the last doorway, I sank, unconscious, upon the ground. That's the end of today's reading. We'll continue tomorrow with the last chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This text is copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. The reading, copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John. More information about this project is at von-junst.org. V-O-N-J-U-N-Z-T. Good night, and I wish you interest.